welcome to Infinity Rewatch. Uh, this is the first podcast ever to be done entirely in American Sign Language. Um, it's going to be hard because you're listening, so we will have to sign loudly. But I don't even know where to start. I wish I knew ASL. Don't I, you? I did too, man. I do too. I, You know, I got to say, I mean, all these movies now are doing it. Dune did it. Marvel's Eternals did it. Hot Guys did it. <laughs> exactly. Between Dune and Macari and Echo and the, the Sand People and Mandalorian, I, I feel like I'm missing out. I want to be able to talk to people and be like, hey, you are my friend. Let's see. I'm, I'm just doing gibberish with my hands. I'm, I'm, <laughs> some, somebody's probably watching me who knows ASL and they're like, first of all, your accent is all wrong. Second of all, you use your pinkies too much. Uh, one day, one day I want to learn. That's going to happen. I, I know how to say, I think thank you is this, right? You put your yeah. hand on your chin and, and you, you go like that. So I think I saw Hawkeye do that. Um, but uh, I'm not Hawkeye yet. I'm just Andrew Fantasia, a lowly podcaster here to talk about Marvel stuff. And who are you? What's up, everybody? If, uh, if he's Hawkeye, then I am Kate Bishop. And uh, we are exploring the wonderful world of Marvel's uh, post-Infinity Saga. Uh, yet to be named, but uh, if I'm not Kate Bishop, then I'm Ryan J. Whitehead, but I'm still a Marvel hero within the Marvel Universe. You are. And I mean, let's be real. If you're anybody, you're Spider-Man. You will always be uh, Spider-Man in my heart. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, that being said, uh, you know, big news, Marvel fans. I'm sure we're all going to have a moment here to, to reminisce, but you, sir, pulled the epic moves of all moves and got <laughs> us tickets to see Spider-Man. That was, it was a harrowing night and morning to say the least. And if it wasn't for you telling me to check at a certain time, I probably would have missed out. So thank you for, for that information. <laughs> but it was, it was literally, it was so strange. The theater that we tried at, I've always had problems booking in advance at that theater um, I don't know. There's something sketchy about their booking. Like I would walk in and I would be like, hi, I'd like to go see Bohemian Rhapsody, please. Uh, at this time. And they're like, well, the theater sold out. So the only ticket we, the only seat we have left is the handicap seat. So I can sell you the handicap seat, but if an actual handicap person comes, you have to give it up to them. And I'm like, okay, fine. And then lo and behold, Ryan, that theater empty with maybe two other people. So, and that happens to me almost every time I go to that theater. So I don't know what is up with their pre-ticket booking, but it's it's not right. And the fact that I logged into their website at 12 o'clock midnight, at the stroke of midnight to buy those tickets, and I kept getting the error messages. And then a minute later, I got a sold out message. The only explanation is either that theater is run by scalpers <laughs> or whoever bought those tickets, it must be Doctor Strange and Wong because they have to have access to the Time Stone. That is the only explanation. <laughs> well, it's that's it. Uh, I mean, I always go Cineplex, um, but also I got to give shout outs to my boy Rav uh, because he had a friend go into the movie theater and that's when he found out that the time was wrong. And fun fact, Cineplex did indeed get the time wrong. And instead of mm. opening at midnight... It was uh, twelve oh one p.m. Uh, <laughs> in on that Monday, and it was nuts. It was nuts. We had a WhatsApp chat going, messages firing away, and uh, all we got. And I have to tell you guys, listening to this this show, all we got from Fantasia was one message. It's going so slowly. Then we didn't hear from him for like I'd say a good ten. 10 minutes 10 15 minutes and of course you think the worst you're like oh my god he didn't do it and so we're like did but he if die he <laughs> but, and, and that's it right like did he die like so what happened right and someone posted the gif of spider-man dancing wasn't you yet because we're like only if you get the tickets you need to do the gif of, of uh toby mcguire peter parker dancing and lo and behold 15 minutes later you post the, the gif of you dancing and you got tickets. <laughs> Pre-screening tickets. Bravo. You did it, man. You did it. That was, I was sweating through that whole 15 minutes, let me tell you. I, and it's crazy because like, I always, like I get that um, 
anxious when it comes time to buy Star Wars tickets. That yeah. when I'm like, oh God, I need to make sure I get them, you know. Uh, and even though I have that sense of like, oh, I have to go, I have to hurry, I have to buy them. I have never had an issue with either the theater selling out or the website not working with Star Wars. Never. Uh, so the fact that it did it for this movie, I was talking to James Rizzoli about it. I was like, you know, what are the odds this movie beats Endgame in the box office? And he he said, you know, with COVID, it's really hard to say. It might not because of COVID. But I'm curious, if there was no pandemic, Ryan, would we be looking at the next number one movie of all time right now? 100% we would. Uh, so? Well, actually, Spider-Man No Way Home did break a record uh, for those listening out there. Um, Spider-Man No Way Home broke the record for the fastest pre-selling tickets ever in a movie for Cineplex. Beat out James yeah. Bond, beat out Endgame. And it's crazy. And and what's funny is, and what's funny is, is like, if you look at this on paper, it's like business people would be like, oh, well, Sony, Sony did it, man. Sony did this. But to be fair, Sony could not have done this, could not have been this close without Feige and the Marvel team. It could not, this could not happen if it were not for Feige. No, the, the amazing Spider-Man 4 would not have pulled these kinds of numbers. You know, they wouldn't be lining up to see GQ model Peter Parker fight <laughs> an, another butchered villain. Hey, guys, yeah. this movie we're going to do uh, the, the Scorpion, except he won't be a Scorpion. He'll be a guy uh, who owns a Scorpion because we're the gritty Spider-Man movies. Uh. <laughs> Actually, from what I heard about the pitch for Amazing Spider-Man 3, it was a pretty weird story and it just didn't make any sense. I, I can't remember the details, but it was apparently... I just remember the person's reaction was just like grotesque. Uh, like it was just really bizarre. It doesn't make any sense. But wow. Like, yeah, no, Sony Sony could not have gotten this far. And uh, as of the time of this recording, Sony already confirmed from Amy Pascal um that uh they're already working on the next spider-man trilogy in conjunction with marvel i can't tell you how happy that announcement made me and i just hope that this doesn't go the way of rogue squadron you know i just i hope this actually gets made they start them they get tom holland to do his thing they do whatever they have to do because the idea of a six movie Spider-Man saga, that's also part of the MCU. I, I, yes. Yes, please. Yes, please. Especially if those other three movies involve a certain someone <laughs> who, who we might've seen today. Well, that, I guess that's as perfect a segue as we're ever going to get. Cause we're talking Hawkeye episode three Woo! where stuff got Real, Ryan. Very real. Uh, we are, uh, you know, it's funny. We are at the time, we are legit precisely at the time where the internet is about to explode, okay? Like, it's erupting right now. Like, it's literally like doing this. It's just like, it's just about to, and for those of you who are listening, I'm literally just shaking my hands as if like, it, you know, I'm making an explosion, but it's just like, like that second before it explodes because... Uh, this show is teasing probably one of the biggest things people have been anticipating for a long time. The rumor, the, ever since Spider-Man No Way Home uh, has been announced in the whole nine yards, the rumor mill has been going nuts. It's just off the chains. And even with Hawkeye, Hawkeye had some crazy rumors. And I agree with you, until certain things happen, you can't say it is what it is. But to me, the evidence is pretty freaking clear. Um, I, you know, I, I watched other shows and we're all we're all saying the same thing that, you know, but we'll get to it. We'll get to it. Um, but but, you know, let's talk about the setup to this this thing I'm talking about here. Yes. First off, we kick off the show with probably again marvel's kicking ass with all these kick-ass character intros and now we get a good full look at the story of echo echo did you recognize the guy who played her dad i did he is the gentleman in uh westworld that's right yeah i was i was really happy to see him i love that dude uh yeah echo was 
again, for, for me who knew nothing about this person, except what you have told me over the course of this show, I was really happy. I wasn't expecting this to open with a flashback, but I was really happy it did because it really cleared the air. It gave me a beautiful just sense of who this person was without uh, like, and it didn't even take too long. I think it was what, like a maybe five minute flashback tops. And now I already understand every reason that Echo has for hating Ronan and hating Hawkeye. Uh, and simple wanting to... yet effective. Yeah, simple very, yet effective. very. And it tells us why she's so good at what she does. She's basically deaf daredevil, right? So she's got the same kind of thing. She's like, okay, I have this issue I can't hear, but I'm going to make the most of it. And I'm going to tune my other senses. So I'm going to be a great fighter and I can swing on flagpoles and do all of that stuff. Uh, and the the drive that she had after losing, you know, her, her family and just kind of having to live with someone else. Um, it, it turned her into this, this being of, of pure ambition and we could see that. And then along comes Ronan and this flashback and that just, that's the final nail in the coffin. And now she is a person with ambition and revenge on her mind. And that's a deadly combination. And right there, that's all we need to tell me, okay, this is why this is our villain. Beautiful. Now I know why that's our villain. Great. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I loved it. I, I think it's, again, I think Marvel's found out a way to tell an origin story. Like, and, and it doesn't, and it's, it doesn't have to solo in on, you know, like, for example, if you're going to do a movie now, the movie doesn't have to be the, in, the entire movie doesn't have to be an origin story. What what's beautiful about this is we're getting we're getting two origin origin stories with backstory on top of lore, like pure like it's all world building in the most beautiful in, in the most yes. beautiful presented way, uh, yes. and because it's it's all about consequences of one character leading to all these branches out and like making the world bigger, but yet keeping it back into this one central story and so echo uh i did a little bit more research on the character one thing i did notice that they did show in this and that's in the comics is she has the photogenic reflexes that taskmaster has and we do see a bit of that in this in this uh entry entry uh part here later on um I but yeah, it was perfect. It was a perfect way to set up the character and just get her going in the Marvel world. And man, is she cool! Like you know, end of episode two, we see her like listening to the speakers and and just the red light, which was really neat. Um, this episode, oh man, okay. So they they talk about some cool things. So her dad, um, her dad talks about you know your person of two worlds. You know, keep your eyes on things. You know. What a beautiful uh, and, metaphor that was, huh? She has mm-hmm. to learn to to walk in two worlds. That was great, really touching. Beautifully said. Uh, I also a really cool nod. Not not a direct nod, but an indirect nod. She's asking if dragons are real. He says yes, uh, but the, you know, or sorry, he said he says like kind of like I don't know. Could but if they are, they're probably in a different world, which obviously alludes to Sang Sang Chi and the Great Protector. Uh, and that because they had to actually cross into another world in order to see dragons. So that mm-hmm. was a nice little nod to that there. Um, and then I, I love the karate sequence. Uh, I think I've watched the beginning of this episode at least a dozen times at this point. Just oh my I God. Just, <laughs> I, I just love the whole flow of it. Like the music, the character intro, all that stuff. But more importantly... Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to say spoilers if you haven't watched it yet. Because surprisingly enough, actually, a couple people that I would think have seen this yet hasn't, have not watched Hawkeye yet. And and I'm starting to notice a little fatigue amongst fellow viewers, um, which is funny because now it's starting to show, uh, you know, starting with the show, I actually had a moment with Isabella who has not caught up with us yet. I had to, cause I watched, I watched the first two episodes without her. And so she hasn't seen it yet. And she was explaining to me before she saw the second episode. She's like, I don't know. I'm a little Marvel fatigue right now. All this, all this Marvel stuff going on. And so we watched the second episode and she's like, this is actually really good. 
So there's, you know, it's, it's interesting to see that. And then of course our co-host Anna has not seen Hawkeye yet. So pretty crazy. It's pretty interesting to see where fans are at right now for me and you, I mean, we have the show. Yes, but I'm, I'm still holding on the ropes. You know, I'm like, I'm holding on the ropes. I'm waiting for that next show. And then the next Loki moment, if you will. And I think we got it. Cue segue, my friend. Cue the segue. Yeah. Because during Echo's story, she goes to a karate class. Her dad's there. And he's like, you know, it's it's more than about um, size. It's about speed. Uh, and he's like, uh, by the way, at the end of your class, your uncle's going to come pick you up. Insert super loud step in. Man in black suit. Reaches out. touch Pinches her cheek. And has the most distinguished laugh that if you watch it and you are a fan of Daredevil, then my friends, you might be getting super excited as the internet is because that that laugh sounds very distinctive to the man who plays him, which is Vincent D'Onofrio's Kingpin may be making his debut in this show by next week. It could happen, people. It could happen. And I'll tell you, I'm just going to add one more thing. There's a lot of evidence, not only in the laugh, the steps, uh, the garage. Uh, we go, we cut to the garage um, after, uh, after that scene. And it's called Fat Man's Garage. And uh, which is a direct reference to a comic book nod where Spider-Man calls him out and just calls him literally the fat man, um, <laughs> which is great. And on top of that, when he touches her face, if you look, if you catch it real quick, there is a cuffling on the end of his sleeve. And it's, and you can't get a good clear shot of what the cuffling looks like, but the shape of it does indicate of the one we saw in Daredevil. Oh boy, I missed that cuff link. Um, I I have been look, I've been pitching my tent in the Kingpin campground for so mm-hmm. long now that I've basically become known amongst all the people who know me as the Kingpin guy. Like I'm not, like any <laughs> any time Kingpin so much. Yeah, any any time his name comes up, people look in my direction and they're like, "Oh, hear that." Um, so if he does show up and I mean, at this point it's really looking like he is, I I'm going to get inundated with, with calls and messages of like, Andrew, Andrew, did you hear what happened? Uh, if he shows up in no way home, that whole row of people is going to turn and look at me. Like it's just going to happen. Uh, I am, uh, I, I woke up a little later yesterday morning than I normally do on Wednesdays because I had a late night. Um, but I was super looking forward to Hawkeye and I, I actually woke up to the sound of you texting me. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, what's this? What's this text? And I, I see that it's from you and you're like, Andrew, did you watch Hawkeye? He's like watching Hawkeye. And there's the thing. And, and you mentioned that you had heard or seen something and you had to double check. And I'm curious, so was it, was it the uncle laugh? that that triggered that okay yeah uh yeah and and then i as soon as i saw that i like jumped literally leaped across the apartment into the shower i got ready i and then i turned on hawkeye um and yeah as soon as he said it's funny because i did not know like i said about echo's story so i did not know she had anything to do with fisk if you had never told me that Ryan, that, that, I, if you had never said, you know, she was raised by Kingpin, whatever. I, I'm i really curious how I would have approached that scene because when he moves away, there's very clearly a hidden character who comes into view. The, the camera makes it very clear. Here is somebody whose face we're not going to show you yet. Um, and then to top it off, there's the big clomping sound of his footsteps. And then the <laughs> as he pinches her cheek. Uh, so I'm really curious, like just doing this little thought experiment of what I would have done had I seen that without this knowledge. And I don't think it would have struck me right away. I think it would have been something after the fact, 
I think I would have been mm-hmm. sitting around like later that night, like or driving to work or something, and I would have been like, "Wait a second. And then I would have probably freaked out. Uh, but the fat man thing, I, I glimpsed right away, and that got me even more excited. So now here we are. We're sitting in this place where Hawkeye himself is acknowledging that he already knows there's somebody higher up, and I guess he would know being Ronin clearing out that dealership uh, that there is somebody above echo uh, and somebody's calling the shots. And now that that has been spoken out loud by an Avenger, that makes it the most real to me. I think. I don't know. I don't know, but I'm, I, like you said, I, I want to immediately just say it's him because that it's the laugh. It's the laugh that gives it away. Honestly, Marvel could have been smart and not done the laugh. And then everyone would have been, everyone would have been skeptical as hell, but because it's his laugh, it's, it's just, oh, it's just so good. Um, but yeah, no, I agree. There's, but there is a couple references, uh, in the auction, Okay, here's an interesting one. You ready for this? Something mm-hmm. something even I missed. In the auction, they talk about there's the head of the criminal organization. They literally say something to those words. So they already nod that there's like a big honcho, you know, behind this whole thing. Mm-hmm. Second is where the auction takes place. Does that ring a bell to you, sir? It was in the wine cellar of, um, oh God, what was that place? I don't remember what it was. Uh, okay, but it, like, uh, I think it's like, uh, let's just say it's like the New York Plaza Hotel. I think that's what it's called. Does that not ring a bell to you? It should. Oh. Well, if they were at the Plaza Hotel, um, I mean, that's where Trump had his cameo in Home Alone 2. And- and, and, you know, Trump is also a really rich criminal. Uh, so there's that. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to tell you. So oh, yeah, tell it's me. the same place, the same place in Daredevil Season 3 where Kingpin was cooped up and he had the wedding at that hotel. Oh, my God. He was at the plaza? Wow. Okay. Okay, this is... This is feeling right. This is feeling right. This is feeling right, right? Okay, so anyway, now there's some interesting things that we need to cover here speculation-wise. So then we get the shot of, you know, uh, uh, Maya Lopez being beautiful as ever, MMA style, super strong. Um, She shows off the photogenic reflexes by by seeing the hand uh, and then knowing that it's coming and then, boom, doing the thing. Um... Uh, I think it's photographic reflexes, I think is what it's called. Uh, anyways, then there's a scene where she goes to the Fat Man Garage. And so she goes to the Fat Man Garage. We see Ronan tearing up the place. Um, now, a couple things that we could address, but I'm going to let you tell me if I should tell you about it or wait to see if it's going to play out. But what I will say is there's two ways this garage could go down. Do you, now, if I were to tell you the comic book story, uh, I told you in the last episode that Kingpin was really behind Maya's father's death. That's right. Right. Based on more research I've done, there is a way they could get around this. Do you, Would you like my prediction or do you want to see how it plays out? No, let's hear your prediction. All right. So in the comics, Echo finds out that Kingpin's behind it and that he shot her dad and it's a whole thing. And and Hawkeye kind of helps her f- figure it out. I don't think that's going to happen in this episode or in this series. I don't think that story is going to take place. And th- another reason too is because Hawkeye and Hawkeye and Echo in the comics do have a bit of a love story at some point. So that's clearly not going to oh. happen. Not going to happen. Just because of the marriage with that beautiful woman, Laura, there, yeah. not going to happen. You it's have good. Linda Cardellini. You are not looking at anybody else. That's, That's it. it. So, so how do you get her to misinterpret uh, the kill? Like, how do you get that story to happen? Well, my theory 
is in the swordsman, which is uh, which is the Jacques guy, the the dad. Mm-hmm. Here's the thing. In the comics, I found out through West Coast Avengers that the swordsman taught Hawkeye everything he knows. Right. I remember reading that too. Yes. So the swordsman taught taught Hawkeye everything he knows. He's also a bad gambler. Um, And uh, my theory is that the that the kingpin ends up asking Jack to take out the guys in the thing and make it look like Ronan. Mm, that's sneaky. That's so that kingpin, we, though. That, right? Because Well, here's the other thing. There seems to be a theme here. Uh, Kate's dad, uh, in the beginning of the show, mentions they have money problems. Mm-hmm. Then Maya's dad, Echo, sorry, Echo's dad, um, mentions they have money problems. So my theory is, and 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 Kingpin gets really happy with his daughter about her like her ability, her karate class and everything. So my theory is is that he realizes at one point doesn't need the dad, and he and he he needs to focus her rage and get her to be like a weapon. So in order to do that, you need to cut all family ties and be the family she needs. Ah, okay. Because if it's one thing I can rely on in Disney shows, family themed and connections. Yeah. I mean, you're right. Like she was, she was training and she was doing all these things to physically perfect herself. But Mm -hmm. As soon as her dad dies, then she becomes a weapon that Kingpin can point at whatever and whoever he chooses. So it, he literally, he turned her into an Avenger by giving her something to avenge, even though she didn't know it came from him. Yeah, that's that's so Kingpin. <laughs> Folks. It is. <laughs> that should be the name of, of the Echo Show instead of just calling it Echo. It's called, That's so Kingpin. And, it, and that would explain why there's an Echo Show. Because then what's going to happen is, is it's her getting back to Kingpin, right? Mm-hmm. And like trying to trying to fight him. That's going to, I'm, I'm telling you, that's going to be Echo's season. That's going to make sense. Perfect villain to carry through the entire series. And on top of that, you could throw in some nice, you know, fun little characters here and there. But you already have the perfect hero villain story right there and then just have fun with it. Yeah. And like you said about how the day of the origin story, and it's you said it so beautifully, like how the origin stories are, they're dead now. You don't need them because you can tell origin stories in this great MCU way where it's two origin stories in this show that's about one of our main six Avengers and how he is slowly, you know, trying to phase himself out as an Avenger because he wants to be with his family. It's the same kind of thing. Like you could use the Echo Show uh, to introduce somebody like Norman Osborn, who would have dealings with Fisk. That would be a great place to to have his first appearance. Sins uh, of you... the father, baby. Sins yeah. of the father. So I have. You know, when they announced that show, I was like, okay, yeah, the villain in Hawkeye is going to get a show, fine, whatever. Like, I I knew nothing. And now the more and more I hear about this girl, the more I'm like, yep, this has to be a thing. This needs to be a thing, specifically for me, so I can see my buddy Big Willie. Uh, That's what I call him. I call him Big Willie. He doesn't appreciate that. (laughs) But, uh, you know, I only call him that on the weekends when it's casual, when there's no business being done. Uh, so that was our flashback of Maya. And then we get this great fight in this toy store, which to me was just wonderful. It was such a nice change of pace. Again, I I hate to keep crapping on Arrow because I do like Arrow a lot. I have watched seven seasons of Arrow now. I think it's a really good show. But when push comes to shove, I would say 90% of Arrow's action scenes are in 
dark, nondescript warehouses. And here we have a scene during the day with sunlight in an abandoned toy store that's got all these toys around. So there's like this flavor, this colorful flavor peppered throughout. And Kate and Clint are using the toys in a very Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, the secret of the use kind of way to their advantage immediately becomes more interesting than 90% of the fights I saw in Arrow when the stuff being done in Arrow fight wise, like physically was pretty much the same, more or less. The setting is so important. I can't stress enough how important setting is for action scenes. So I'm so glad that Marvel's continued to make sure their settings are not uh, forgettable. And I, I think that's why I, I go back to Endgame and I'm like, as much as I loved Endgame as a movie, the final fight is nothing to me compared to the final fight of Infinity War because Wakanda was actually green and bright and well lit and there were different levels, whereas in Endgame, you were just fighting in purgatory and everything was cloudy. So you yeah. you need a, a great setting to make your action scene uh, a step beyond uh, what it is like it, it can evolve so much just by putting it in the right spot at the right time of day so thank you whoever choreographed and plotted out this toy store fight because damn i liked it it was really good and we do get to see more of echo do her uh do her photogen photographic reflexes where like again hawkeye throws a giant stuffed animal and then when she catches up with them she throws a stuffed animal uh you know he picks up a bow she picks up a bow like you do see you do see some layers there of that the other interesting thing uh about this uh fight scene too is just you get that real good comic book fight man i see a lot of athletic moves especially from echo uh fun fact in the book uh in the little grade two book she writes she wants to learn capoeira uh and literally later on you see her do capoeira like moves with the flips and the 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 big kicks and everything so um kind of interesting to see those kind of kind of things happening there this i gotta say i i was nervous about this show i was but this episode is completely eliminated and made me like 20 times more excited now um and again this is exactly what i'm saying with like these shows and why what if for me didn't quite work within the same formula as the other ones because they all have a clear anchor point and they build that world. And so anyways, this fight scene is so much fun. Um, and I love seeing Echo fight. Oh my God. I just like, even the MMA fight scene that she has, like right after her kid sequence, it's like two seconds, but it, it like, for me, it's fun. It's just mm -hmm. that just the way, just the, her focus in those shots is just such a joy to watch. Um, and then, yeah. And then the cool thing is we see Hawkeye, fight henchmen a little bit more because to be fair he doesn't he hasn't really fought people he hasn't really fought individuals uh, on a henchman level he's only fought mindless hive minded robots and and crazy space dogs um <laughs> or space mutants or whatever you want to call it but he hasn't really fought uh he hasn't really fought like henchmen i guess the best way to say it even in Civil War, he he fought Vision and he fought Black Panther, but he didn't fight henchmen really. So it was nice to see him kind of just tear it up and be the hero. He, you know, we always love seeing heroes take on henchmen because you clearly know they they're above the skill level of like most characters. So it was kind of fun to see that. I see him kind of roll uh, roll out of the the uh, second floor and then shoot an arrow and like you know cut the thing. So it was just. Nice to see those hero the hero moments. Um, and you're right. It was just a beautiful setting for a fight scene. And it was just gorgeously done. And I really ended up liking, um, I don't, I forget his name, but Echo's buddy. The oh, guy, yeah. He's, yeah. He's just like, yes. Yeah. He's just her lieutenant there. Um, it's rare to really connect with a henchman in, in I find, modern cinema it just doesn't happen as much anymore except you know james bond still does it really well but i find it really rare so when it happens i love it and i really ended up thinking that this guy was cool and i liked the the play that he has with echo i like how they they have this sort of understanding um he had probably the funniest line of the episode where he's like 
but you think these idiots have gone and learned ASL in the past 24 hours? Like, no, like, just, just stop and talk to me for a second. Yeah. Uh, so he's, uh, he's really intriguing. And I have a feeling just based off of what we've been speculating, which, you know, our sneaky Feige radar should dissuade me from throwing out too many theories like this. But um, if you want a good reason to have Echo hate somebody, whether it's, Hawkeye or whether it's Kingpin, you have that somebody either accidentally or on purpose kill this guy because it seems like they're buddies. So you want to get on her bad side, you cause the death of Aja. And I think that that's going to happen, whether it's in this show or in the Echo show. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to happen in this one is because it just, it plays on that, that theme of, because like her dad can connect with her, right? With the sign language. And so can he. So the, for her to constantly lose those parts of her world in another world, I think is, is going to be good writing and, and a good way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, but I, I, uh, I, so, so the other thing I love is the car chase shot. The one shot car chase was yeah. so good um i this is the second time i've seen it uh only because they put it in the preview uh for the marvel showcase uh for uh, disney plus day and just that constant panning circular is really well done uh honestly for those of you listening this is this is this is the episode that will sell and it's starting to help kind of create this theory that Marvel's third and fourth episode of these series are like the big game changers, like the big, you know, something pivotal happens in the third or fourth episode. Um, or sorry, the third and fourth episode. Uh, you know, WandaVision had uh, WandaVision had the introduction of, um, of the outside uh, world, really. That happened in the fourth episode, but it was perfect. Uh, what's her name, though? Oh my God, Spectrum? Agatha? No, no, the hero, the hero girl, the other hero, the daughter of uh, Lieutenant Trouble. That one. Oh, Mrs. Uh, Rambo, Monica. Yeah, Monica Rambo. Thank you. Um, she, uh, I think her name, I think her hero name Spectrum, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, anyway. I think so. Anyway, not relevant, but yes, uh, Rambo. So we get the introduction of Rambo in that episode, and then we find out about Sword, the whole nine yards. And that's a big moment. And then episode four, we get a tease for potentially the Fantastic Four if you want to you want to go that route. <laughs> Fantastic Four. Um, but uh, but Loki, you get the introduction of Enchantress slash Lady Loki. Uh, in Falcon Winter Soldier, you get the uh, you get the Black Panther and um, sorry the Dora Milaje and uh, Zemo, uh, mm -hmm. and then in i think i've covered pretty much all of them yeah so the three the three four mark man that's uh that's that's a big one and the cool thing about this one too is is after the whole car chase it was cool to see the trick arrows some really cool shots uh some great humor too um we get to see uh another hank pym uh arrow uh another team up of hawkeye and hank pym uh, I reacted really loudly when I saw that arrow. That was a beautiful moment. I can only yeah. imagine what you did. You must have. You must have been. Happy. I was pretty. I was like, ah! like it was <laughs> so good. I I always kind of like I kind of like lift my knees and then roll forward, just like super exciting. Um, and yeah, no, it was it was just oh, I but I want to see more of that because. At this point, past Infinity Saga, they're such established characters. Over 10 years of movies and content. So we want to see as much crossover now as possible because we've waited yes. long enough. Like we've gotten we've gotten some Avengers movies, yes. But now you have to evolve on, as Kevin Feige so eloquent, eloquently put, uh, the cross-pollination. Like you, you should be peppering in that cross-pollination as much as possible at this point yes and it, as far as you know people showing up great yeah captain marvel pops in great but even these little things like seeing the pim arrow is a beautiful way of reminding us that yeah these people are all friends they go to the same barbecues 
Of course yeah. he's going to have a Pym arrow. Why would he not have a Pym arrow? I love all of the different arrows he has. I, I don't know what the suction cup one does yet. I was going to ask you uh, if you knew. The plunger what arrow. The, the plunger, yeah. Uh, or if we should make uh, make bets, play some never tell me the odds of what it might uh, what it might do. I love the one that releases the purple ooze. Uh, that's it's just I love that it's purple because it's Hawkeye. It's just it's beautiful. And I mean, that car chase, it's funny because like you and I both have had screen acting training. We both have directed things and filmed things. We know our way around cameras. I couldn't for the life of me tell you how they filmed that that car. Where, you know, this camera is spinning 360 degrees inside this car. I I don't know what was going on there whether that was just all cgi trickery or what but it was pretty beautiful i honestly couldn't tell you myself i i could tell you how they could have done 180 degrees of it but to do but to do a full 360 was pretty impressive um the only thing i could suggest as a trick is uh when i saw the kingsman for the first time the church fight scene which looks as if it were one shot it was mm -hmm. actually, I was like, man, they had, it was, had to be one shot. Like they had a steady cam guy and they just, they choreographed that thing to, you know, the, the bitter end. And I found out later on is they actually cleverly found points to hit cut and, and, and essentially blend the cut and transition to, into the next sequence. So it was really well blended. So I'm having a feeling that they actually filmed that, that, car chase scene but the but they found ways to cut and transition uh without breaking the flow of a one-shot sequence and and marvel's never been shy with the one-shot sequences um they did that with uh age of ultron that age of ultron the, the introduction sequence is all one-shot sequence yeah yeah they're they love i love when they do that they do that a lot um, and I think thinking back in the Kingsman one, it's been a long time since I saw it, but you're right. There's, there's some, some magic, some pixie dust, some movie making pixie dust going on there where if I remember right, when he's fighting in the church, there's a lot of speed ramping going on. I think they, they utilize a lot of speed ramps. So he will, he'll swing at a guy. And then as the guy's falling, he'll quickly move to the next guy and you'll be like, okay, they sped that up a bit and then they'll tilt around. So you're right. There's a lot of places there for them to, uh, strategically cut. I can't imagine that would have been easy to choreograph. So, wow, all the power to him. I think you're right. I think the same thing happened here. I think maybe they figured, okay, we'll get coverage for when we're pointing out the back, coverage for when we're pointing at the front, and then some spinning during which we can cleverly cut. Um, even though the background stayed pretty consistent, they might have used green screen or even had the volume. I don't know what they would have done. But uh, I, I would imagine they would have, I guess they would have had to have it on some kind of crane because yeah. when we're pointing out the windshield at the end, we're following uh, Haley outside of that car when she leans out to fire so we're we're there in the car, and then we follow her out, and it's it's a, a seamless follow. So they um, they might have built. I, I feel like they might have built the windshield and the the rear window to be removable. Get your coverage with this, and then remove that piece of glass and get your coverage with the back. And, yeah. and having it be removable means the camera can could have come in and out and it would have been simple but uh that's the power that's that's the stuff we don't see that makes these things taste so good right the secret little ingredients so. it, it was just great like as a comic book fan and, and an action movie lover like as long as they keep doing fight scenes like that just just keep going and the best part is is it's the blend of practicality versus cg like just keep walking that very fine line uh, because yeah. the more practicality you have, the more you can kind of do some small CGs to, to, as patchwork. But like overall, it should feel as real as possible. Like that that whole Pim Arrow thing fit in beautifully. It just fit in beautifully. And it just made the fight scene just feel that much more immersive and fun. 
but uh, it was perfect. And so the plunger arrow, um, the plunger arrow, I I believe uh, can be act can act as a tracker, uh, but it also acted as the. Uh, um, I think it's more actually, yeah. I'm I'm gonna say it's more of a tracker than anything else. Oh, okay, so it uh, it, it sort of guided his other arrows towards it uh in a a matter of speaking that's one way to look at it another way of looking at it is again um yeah like if he if he wanted to track somebody like what would happen is if it like when it hits its target and they pull it off it it, there's a tracker on the the thing like a tiny microscopic right uh but then also as you see it had a more practical purpose where it helped them stick on to the subway (laughs) <laughs> as they were uh yeah as they were running so uh yeah those trick arrows man i gotta get me some trick arrows i want a boxing glove arrow like in yeah like i think green i think green arrow uses the boxing glove arrow if i'm he, not mistaken he does uh in the cartoon is probably the best adaptation of the boxing glove arrow he does mm. in arrow use the boxing glove arrow it's the episode yes. where they introduce uh uh what's his name wily cat wildcat Wildcat, um, yeah. Yeah, and he and he, he sticks the arrow right in the glove. Yeah. Yeah. That was perfect. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I the director at that time was just like, I just want to have a boxing glove. Uh <laughs> boxing glove arrow. But I, I love it. I love the boxing glove arrow. It's it's phenomenal. And I, I think that, you know, this car chase reminded me of something. It reminded me of the and it's I wanna find the right way to put this in words so that I sound as little of an idiot as possible and just as profound as I possibly can. But there, this is a holiday show. It's a Christmas themed show. And I think that Christmas shows and movies should feel the key word is they should feel cozy. Right. I think that makes sense. Christmas is a time where you, you huddle up in your home, you get warm, you get cozy, you surround yourself with decorations and stuff like that. Um, Christmas should be cozy. Christmas things should be cozy. And the thing is, we're we're here in New York City. New York City goes all out at Christmas time. But and this is just my personal architectural taste, I guess. But modern cities do not look cozy for me. They're too. They're too stark. They're too cold. Just the way that we build things now, the way our signage is, the way our our, our architecture works, it's not conducive to a very cozy atmosphere. Uh, if this was 70s or 80s New York, it would be a whole different story. 70s and 80s New York is the depiction of cozy. They practically paved the streets with shag carpeting, for God's sake. <laughs> so it's... Uh, it's a very two different, very aesthetic worlds. And what I really appreciated is that, yes, Hawkeye is set in modern New York City. Uh, yeah. However, they went to great lengths, and I noticed it the most here, to make everything cozy and colorful and warm. And it, it struck me because the car he steals is not a new car. It's an old car. An old car, the interiors of old cars look cozy and warm and they're escaping from not a brand new building, but an old dusty abandoned toy store, which was old enough that it also looked cozy. It looked like they were when the scene starts and they run out of that building and get into that seventies car, you know, challenger aside, whatever that car was that he wasn't going to break. You could have taken that image and put it in something like the French connection. And it looks like it fits. It looks like it's in the same time period. And that has kind of carried on throughout. You know, there's little instances where Kate's on her cell phone or whatever, but most of the time, it's a very cozy, almost timeless feel. Even the uh, the yeah. TV in, in Kate's aunt's apartment when they're watching the TV, it's an old TV. I think there was a cathode tube in that. So I was like, man, this is this is striking all the right Christmas cozy notes for me, and I hope they keep it up. I think they should, but you know, it's it's funny you bring it up because. I think I think what's interesting about this kind of thing is that Marvel is doing a Christmas story. You know, like it's 
it i mean yes we've seen it with iron man 3 if you really want to go there but this is a direct christmas story i think this fits within the rules of christmas time um it kind of like die hard you know where die hard takes place during christmas and you know i remember they were saying there's a certain rules you have to hit but you're right so i think this will be kind of that timeless christmas classic if you will and and what better way to do that when then introducing or reintroducing one of the characters people want the most uh which is you know a d'onofrio kingpin and making making the mcu world even bigger like like we are almost at a point where the crossovers are going to get nuts and it's but i think what i also like about this and kind of to bring it back on topic is that we're getting these year round stories is like yeah. like i hope in the uh, we are getting like a guardians of the galaxy holiday special which it, my money is like i hope it plays out like the star wars holiday special if it doesn't i'll be i'll be super pissed cuz like you you have all the tools to kind of play on that parody but yeah i i think that marvel is becoming so institutional that we're seeing these holiday episodes as if it were you know your kind of soap opera or comedy series um or just lighthearted family show where it just it plays long enough that it starts playing in sync with different seasons and we saw that even with one division one division's a halloween special if you think about it yeah that's a great way to put it man you're right it has become institutional that it's no longer uh, a sort of annual or biannual event uh, it's a thing that's happening all year long. And when we get to Christmas in the real world, so does Clint Barton and his gorgeous wife and his three children. So yeah, we're going to talk about the fact that it's Christmas time and he wants to get home. Uh, and you're right. I would like to see them continue sort of acknowledging that, you know, that they are keeping a pace with us, even though I think they're four years in the future now because of the the post blip uh yeah but uh, other than that yeah sure it's 2025 but they're still they're still keeping up with us they you're right like the soap operas and the sitcoms when it's christmas for us it's christmas for victor newman right so we we feel that sense of connectedness i love that i love that the way you phrase it it's become institutionalized to the fact to the point where they're along for the ride with us now uh wow that's great and no way home is also going to be christmas themed from what we've heard so mm -hmm. yeah so th it sounds like dr strange and the multiverse of madness is going to take place on everybody's 14th favorite holiday memorial day you heard it here first <laughs> you know it could um because it's coming out late may so there you go yeah yeah, it's true. Uh, it's, yeah, no, it's gonna be interesting, man. It's gonna be an interesting. Uh, it's gonna be an interesting time. But I, I love it. I, I, I. As long as Marvel can keep up what they are doing with like shows like WandaVision, Hawkeye, Falcon, Winter Soldier, and Loki, then I hope that it, this becomes continuously year round, and it does feel that way. Like they're. They're doing really well, so they need to keep it up. I'm a little skeptical on Miss Marvel, only because I don't know much about that character. But if her story is anything like the video game, then it's going to be really, really good. Uh, but um, yeah, no, I mean, like, yeah, I I think it's very much an institution now at this point, and they just got to honestly take it as far as they can go. And and the more crossovers, the better. Uh, so yeah, and and Spider Man. If Spider-Man's a Christmas movie, then they're going to kick off. Obviously, then I think that movie could also have a New Year's tie-in in some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. Usually when you do a big New Year's thing, you know, you want to do a resolution or you want to, you want to, you know, I think you want to tease what to expect in the next year. And I think Spider-Man's going to do that. I, I have a feeling, apparently the rumor is with spider-man is that the reason why they put out the sinister six villains uh already is because that is to distract us from the bigger surprise at hand and i don't know what that big surprise could be i have no freaking idea but 
there's but the there was a writer that was confirmed saying that the sinister six thing is a distra- is it's a distraction from a bigger bigger uh bigger rumors that that people are alluding to and are is this big thing supposed to be something that happens in no way home or something that's going to happen in the future going to happen in no way home oh my god well i mean um i wouldn't be surprised if the movie ends where they go the one more day slash brand new day route where um it, it kind of starts his story over in a way but not quite where nobody remembers everything except him um and then he's he's running around and mary jane's like hey i don't know who you are uh i i think they might pull some things from that because dr strange was involved in that and so was mephisto so hey if that's the big thing if mephisto shows up in that movie i mean what better way to distract the one thing everybody's been talking about, you know, people won't shut up about for all of 2021, you guide their eyes and ears and hearts and minds away from it by saying, here's the Sinister Six. And also, do, 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 and Mephisto shows up. And, yeah. I I honestly think, I honestly think there might be a Madam Web drop. Ooh, I'd be down for Madam Web. 100% I'd be down for Madam Web. Could you Web. picture it though? Because could you picture after everything that happens? everything like the whole the reset thing everything all the dust is settled you know they're dr strange like you know spider-man's like what can i do now and all this stuff like what do i do like what do i do after all of this because i tried to live two lives it didn't work what am i supposed to do and then come in insert madam web with the tarot cards and being like you think this is over you know like you're you're about to be tested and then like you know enter the secret wars and bob's your uncle Ooh, or ben I ben's your uncle because uncle ben ben's <laughs> your uncle that's right wow well played uh yeah that's madam webb was you know those last couple seasons of the spider-man cartoon were so out there and trippy in the greatest possible way and had so much crossover it really feels like they're going in that direction man so it does. I, yeah, I would not rule out Madam Web at all. She is, I'd say she's almost an eventuality at this point rather than just a possibility. Um, same with Wilson Fisk, I hope. Dear Lord, I hope. Uh, so Next week's episode is going to be big. We need to watch it together. I'm telling you right now. Yes, next week I will definitely be up in time to watch it simultaneously with you. I just I had a very long Tuesday night. Um, oh, uh, one thing I wanted to bring up before we sign off here is, uh, in the subway, when Kate yeah. and, Cl- and uh, Clint are riding the subway, did you notice there's a sign behind them in the subway car with a very blatant, uh, error written in the sign. The sign says, I wrote it down here. I don't know what it's advertising, whatever, but it says this quote, are you feeling like there are no options? Interesting. Yeah. Uh, now, I mean, Marvel do- does pretty much everything on purpose. So I don't, I don't know if this is just me being crazy at this point, if I'm turning into somebody who's got to start putting cork board in my walls, but does this does this mean anything to you they took out the word r is missing from this is this just they happen to film in a real nyc subway car that had a real <laughs> ad with player. a real typo in it are you feeling like there are no options ryan is what i'm asking you uh i don't know man i don't know if that's a nod to anything honestly it, it does feel kind of weird that it's pretty front and center and and not knowing what it is to be honest with you i would say but to kind of kind of land the plane here i i gotta say i I don't know i'm gonna just say i don't know about that sign it's it just seems really weird what i will say is interesting to me because i did i did i watched i watched the second episode with isabella before watching this one and a couple things come to mind did you do you remember an end game that clint was so eager 
to sacrifice himself so that widow would get the soul stone and he's like tell my family goodbye you know all this stuff Mm -hmm. then in this show uh then in this show he um when he goes to when he goes to the the larpers and the guy's like oh you gotta we gotta do trial by combat it would really help me out he's like all right and he was he's like you gotta kill me so he's really offering to give his life for for the greater good i guess in a way of saying which leads me to believe one of two outcomes one i don't think he's gonna survive i think he's gonna get killed I have a I have a strong prediction that that Barton's going to get killed in the show. Okay, or what's two, your second outcome? Mm-hmm. The other theme I'm starting to notice is he keeps missing things. He keeps missing time with his family, time with his family. And the auction, they were stealing a the the tracksuit mafia was stealing a watch which seems to be irrelevant to all the events that are happening right now. But if that watch pays true homage to the comic book reference, then it has to do with Kang. And what if, it's a bit of a stretch, bit of a stretch for the theory here, but what if this Hawkeye decides uh, somehow Kang gets involved in, in this whole show in some, some way, shape, or form? And and Hawkeye goes to another reality where he didn't survive, and then he gets to get that time back with his family. Ooh. The only problem with that theory is why would he leave his current family to go back to another time, right? Yeah, unless they get killed. Mm-hmm. Um... Or or he fakes his death. Yelena, Yelena gets like he gets to explain what happened to Natasha that she's like the big big hero and all this stuff, and Yelena comes in and he's like he's he he tries to allow her to kill him and she can't do it after explaining like what actually happened, and they come to an agreement that he fake kills her or sorry fake kills him and then he gets to go back to his family and Kate takes over as Hawkeye. Yeah. I like that idea. Yeah, I think we mentioned something like that too last week about him faking a death. Yeah. Um, I think that that's very possible here. Um, but I also, I like both of these trains of thought. I like this one just because it's really cool and it leads to some cool possibilities. But I like the idea of the first one too where Hawkeye gets killed in action here because this is just my own, for my own selfish reasons completely. But what a great way to introduce Kingpin if he's the one who does it. As you you roll him out, it's like, here's Kingpin. He's back. He's better than ever. He's in his white suit. And he's, as far as I can tell, the first character to, the first villain, rather, to kill off an Avenger for good. I would like it. Black Widow died by her own hand. Iron Man died by his own hand, literally. Uh, Gamora died by Thanos. Gamora did die by Thanos. She wasn't technically an Avenger. I I was going to say, she's not an Avenger. She's a Guardian, right? She's a Guardian. So, I'm on board for either of these two. I'm I'm totally on board. I'm actually, now that I've, you know heard what you said and like reminisced with it a little bit i'm going to say that the fake death is the probably going to be the most likely outcome why Mm -hmm. because it fits all the stories like it it fits like you could you could have yelena fake kill him in front of echo echo drops the pursuit and kate Kate, through her investigation, gets to Kingpin and then fights Kingpin. Echo tries to fight her 
And through that fight, they, she, they find out that it's actually the swordsman that killed Echo's dad. And then it's, it's Echo and Kate versus Kingpin and swordsman. Yeah. Beautiful. Uh, I, I, and but to me, because to me, that it through the fake death of Hawkeye, it just kind of ties everything together. Yeah, it gives him an out the way that time travel gave Steve Rogers an out. Yeah, because um, he's, I mean, he's got that family, and it plays uh-huh. on the LARPing thing because he was like trial by combat, just make it look good. Yes, and he fakes his death. Yes, yes, you're right. You're it. right. That's it. Epiphany it's moment. Epiphany moment on the show. Again, this is three for three shows in a row. Three, or sorry, three out of four. Three out of four. Because I don't think we had an epiphany moment in, in what if, but the other ones we did. No, I think we did. Did, did we, we have a? Did we have a moment? Yes, in what if we had an episode where I said. Watch the last episode is going to going to be what if the watcher interferes? Oh yeah, yes. Oh snap! Oh my god! Wow! Look at us go four for four, four for four, four for four, four. 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 fantastic four <laughs> on an outer space adventure. So Kevin, when are you going to hire us? When are you going to hire <laughs> us, Kevin? I mean, we're doing your job for you over here, really. Practically, yeah. Jeez, we might as well write the show ourselves. Gig glad. <laughs> Oh boy. Well, that was Hawkeye episode three. Um, we're halfway through this season already. I am I gotta tell you, last week was just a a gamut of um anticipation for Hawkeye. And I'm it, it's it's continuing to grow. If this keeps up, it's going to be my favorite Marvel show so far. Ooh, bold words. Bold words. If it keeps up, and obviously, if a certain sexy bald crime lord shows up, that's going to sway my vote. But Uh, yeah, (laughs) yeah, it's looking like it's going in that direction. Uh, Does Isabella? You mentioned Isabella said something to you about Kingpin. Does she know how how crazy I will go if he shows up? Is she aware of my? She she knows. She knows how crazy you're going to be when the big man shows up. That's why she was joking about how I'm going to like jump off the balcony if it's not if it's not Big <laughs> Willie. It's not Big Willie Fisk himself. Like it just it has to be. It has to be. You will disappoint all the MCU fans if you don't make it D'Onofrio. Oh, I know, that's the thing, right? That if it's if it's anybody else, even if it's Storm and Norman, you're you're letting down a lot of people. So, uh, including not only, not only, I'm not even talking like a different character. I'm talking about if it is Kingpin and it ain't D'Onofrio. <laughs> oh, oh God, that would, yeah, I don't think they would go that far. That's yeah. that would be awful. Like, who else are they gonna find? Who are they gonna hire? Uh, Chris Pratt, he's playing everybody now. <laughs> he's playing hey Mario. guys, I'm, I'm Kingpin too. Hey, what's up? <laughs> Uh, that's a pretty good impression, actually, you know? But, but yeah, no, it's it has to be. It has to be. The fans want it, and and I know, like, a lot of interviews I've seen with Foggy, he always says, if if the fans want it bad enough, we'll make it happen. And yeah. and that, so to me, that's like checks in the mail, we're getting our kingpin. And, and if that's true and we get kingpin, then oh my god let the comic book storytelling begin because and i can see why you're excited because if we get the kingpin if we get d'onofrio kingpin then at this point like the storytelling potential is off the charts like you go anywhere you want and you know it's funny i remember when uh, when batman v superman was coming out like it was in production and i i still remember the day they announced Lex Luthor was going to be played by Jesse Eisenberg. And I had a good laugh and I was like, okay, no, really, who, who's, who's going to play Lex Luthor? And it turns out it was Jesse Eisenberg. And I made a joke to somebody. I think I even wrote it on Facebook. I, I, I said, uh, this just in, breaking news, because this was before the Daredevil show. It's like, breaking news, Marvel has cast Michael Sarah as the kingpin. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, yeah, no, exactly. Like, but that's the thing. Like, after I thought Michael Clark Duncan was a was an amazing cast. For he, he was. He was even, a really good kingpin. Even though that movie was was not 
great at all. Poor Ben. Not Ben's fault. Not Ben's fault. Uh, but um, yeah, I thought he was a good cast. And I'm like, well, you know, at that time, I was like, there's no one else that could do it better than, than like Clark Duncan. And then yeah. not that, not that, you know, you know, not that D'Onofrio is like the best, but he's the best. Like Michael oh. Clark Duncan, would he still be alive today? He would have been like, you know what? That was the good casting for Kingpin. Oh yeah. He would have, been, as soon as they said D'Onofrio had been cast in the role, I just remember sitting back and thinking like, my God, that is perfect. Like I never in a million years would have thought of him, but he's just, yes. I, like all, all the yes. I, all I, all I had a moment of was like D'Onofrio. I'm like, who's this D'Onofrio guy? Cause this was before, before I watched Law and Order with uh, Isabella and like learned about criminal intent and learned more about D'Onofrio. The only thing I knew about D'Onofrio at the time was uh, he did this incredible uh, captivating performance in Men in Black. And I was like, oh my God, that's the guy from Men in Black. And I was like, okay, this is going to be, this is one of those Marvel castings where you're just like, this is an interesting choice. Then the trailer came out and I was like, that's it. Yeah. That's a mic drop moment right there. Yeah. And as there, I, there was a moment in season one where I think he's walking down an alley next to the owl, Leland Owlsley. And yeah. first of all, I'm freaking out because the owl is like every <laughs> moment of that show. I was like, oh my God, the owl. Oh my God, Vanessa. Like I, I was, I was free. So I see him walking in that alley with the owl. And even though he has a black coat on, he doesn't look kingpin-esque yet. Just something about the way they filmed him and he was so beefy and, you know, he had the thick neck and that coat. And I'm like, that's him. I'm, I'm looking at the kingpin right now. And then as we got gradually up to that white jacket, I was in flavor country and I can't believe how much time I've spent talking about this character. And he still has not shown up officially in Hawkeye, but he's coming. He's coming. So help me. He is coming. And if it's not D'Onofrio, it'll be Leslie Bibb playing the kingpin. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, Ryan, where can the good people find you? As always, you can find me on twitch.tv forward slash Xbox Canada. And of course, you can find me on Instagram at Ryan J. Whitehead and on Twitter at Crusader Online, to which I'll be tweeting to Vincent D'Onofrio. I already did once and I'm pretty sure he's looked at it. But uh, oh. you can find me on Twitter at Crusader Online. He's an active Twitter guy. So if, if, uh, if you message him, he may reply. Oh my God. I want to meet him now at like a convention and be like, Mr. D'Onofrio, can you please pretend to be killing me? <laughs> just... Can you just touch my cheek and do the laugh thing? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know that's what you want. I know uh, that's what you want. I'm going to, I'm going to find some way to weasel my way into Hollywood and play Alistair Smythe. So I can just be in his presence as part of my job. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, and you can find me on Twitter at Andrew Fantasia, on Instagram at Andrew underscore Fantasia, and on YouTube, the Andrew Fantasia YouTube channel, and here on Rebels Come Podcast as well. Uh, and uh, then you can also find me freaking out if uh, next week a certain somebody shows up. But in the meantime, you know, Kingpin notwithstanding, I love the Hawkeye show. Um, I love Hawkeye. I love Kate. I love Echo. I love Kate's evil mom, who's clearly up to something, and we know she means trouble i love jack the swordsman with his porn stash uh, i love lucky the one-eyed dog uh i love the tracksuit mafia i love the cozy car is this is i'm all in i'm on board for this um so that has been infinity rewatch i hope all of you have a marvelous day hey scumbags thanks for watching don't forget to give us a thumbs up on our video as always, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Rebel Scum Podcast, for all the latest videos.